while we do use AI significantly for optimization, we still do have, you know, manual human resources that actually keep a check on these AI, especially in the realms of ad fraud. Where can AI help user acquisition managers? Hello and welcome to Growth Masterminds. My name is John Gutzier. We all know UA is hard. We also know AI is getting pretty freaking amazing. Where can it help with user acquisition with growth? And can you trust it? To dive in, we're chatting with Fahim Saeed. He's the director at App Samurai. They operate a DSP. They have an on-device OEM product and our growth agency. Welcome, Fahim. How are you? Hey, John. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me. I hope you are well. I am well also. Thank you. It's chilly, though. It's winter here in the Northern Hemisphere, and it sucks. You're in New York, so sometimes it's cold. Sometimes it's warm. I've been in New York in the winter, and one day it was like snowing and slush on the streets, and the next day it was sunshine, blue sky, and I was walking out in a t-shirt. So New York is crazy that way. It is, it is, it is. So we started off the week at 65 degrees. Now we are down to 33. So as you mentioned, it's New York. doesn't fail to impress you. I speak Celsius. I don't understand that Fahrenheit crap, but it's all good. <laughs> Let's get on our topic here. When you're making a successful campaign, there's creative, there's targeting, there's some kind of offer, there's measurement, there's optimization. Where can AI help the most? And has somebody made like a chat GBT for market my game? Right, John. So everybody is trying to build out a custom GPT with the whole chat GPT-4 in play. So recently there was actually one of these LinkedIn influencers that released a GPT that would help you design a certain workflow for a game. So let's say if you wake up one day with a bright idea, hey, I'm going to write a game, right? So where do you start off? What tools would you need? How would you build a game? How would you monetize it? How would you do user acquisition? So there's a whole GPT that's built around that. That's very interesting. But the way you asked this kind of, so back in the day, let's say designing a game was quite a complicated task. And then with AI in place, what it has done is it has taken a lot of workload off. So let's say you are an indie game developer. So back in the day, probably you might need a couple of freelancing outsourced people that would help you build a certain game out. But now with these resources from AI, with a one or two man show, you can actually build out a certain project, do a quick soft launch, use A-B testing. Even the creatives can be designed by an AI. So things like these are something that have been adding great value in at least the game creation process. Of course, after that, kind of you have more aspects to this whole layer, but the whole aspect of AI in user acquisition starts off at the game designing. I noticed your light is going on and off, is, so I, I, I don't know. This. <laughs> it's a bit of a New York thing, but I think we should be good for the rest of the show. Yeah. Well, New York's a third world country. I'm familiar, very familiar with it. I've stayed in a lot of hotels there, including ones that were not the $400 a night variety. So I've been there, done that. So what you're saying is there's a lot of capability for AI to help with growing a game. Frankly, game idea. You can ask ChatGPT for lots of game ideas and bounce ideas off of it. There's, there's a lot of stuff there. And yes, there's a lot of stuff for generative AI, for art and for elements of your game and other things like that. Even parts of coding it, maybe big parts. And there's obviously no code tools as well. In terms of the marketing stuff, in terms of the ad tech stuff specifically, what's the most useful stuff that you've seen in terms of AI? So a lot of the apps usually that tend to outsource user acquisition to app growth agencies, while you could do a soft launch, you could do some A-B testing on Facebook and Google. Now, keeping in mind that you are a single one-man show and you don't have a big army of UA managers, especially in the world of agencies and ad tech platforms is where AI has been quite game-changing. A lot of it has to do with optimization. So back in the day, all the optimization, even this day, whether you have an in-house resource of UA managers or it's outsourced to an agency, analysis is something that kind of takes a lot of time as well, pulling off those Excel and those CSV numbers. With AI, what we have seen is a lot of well-run analysis that you can basically summarize on, especially when you are at a soft launch stage. So this basically helps you save a lot of time and money because the most disruptive part of any game designing is the soft launch phase where you either make it or you basically break, right? And with the introduction of generative AI and a lot of these analysis, and as you mentioned, no code platforms, they offer their own analysis and machine learning. So without having the need for a certain data scientist or a data team, you can still decide on if this game is yielding the results that you seek it to. And especially for the agencies, a lot of it to do with optimization. So as you grow a game, you have more and more data in-house. Now, once you have all of this data, right, you are able to build out an audience. So building an audience, setting up personalization, recommendation, which user base is the best, depending on the genre of the game. You got casual, hyper-casual, mid-core, 
So, you know, what audience is fitting in which creative, which realm of things, I think that's what AI is stepping in its game as well. Yeah, I know Singular, for instance, is using AI with some high level data science to understand what's going on to model what's going on, let's say with SCAD network data, that sort of thing, to model it with other data, predict what is going to happen, D3, D7, D30, all that sort of stuff and seeing a lot of data. Are you using that on a targeting side as well on your DSP? So Singular is a very big partner for App Summer for the past two years as well. So all the data prints that Singular has, for example, so when we do have a customer on the DSP or on the offerable side for games, we do leverage these kind of data points. Singular gives us all these ideas on an X amount of users are reaching level 10, level 20, for example, right? So based on that, we do have an optimization mechanism. While I do mention that while we do use AI significantly for optimization, we still do have, you know, manual human resources that actually keep a check on these AI, especially in the realms of ad fraud. A lot of ad fraud has been going on and... As of yet, at least in my experience, I haven't seen AI being used in the realm of preventing ad fraud at a scale. So while the analysis does come in that, hey, X amount of users amount to Y amount of levels or in-ad revenues that you would basically see reflect on MMP, but you still need that human intervention to read through those MMP layers and actually make build an audience as well. Talk about campaign optimization. This is a challenging thing, right? It was challenging when there was full-on IDFA on iOS, and it's still challenging on Android with the GID, which we know is not going to be here forever and probably going to disappear sometime in early to mid-2024. But that's something that would be amazing to automate, theoretically, right? Theoretically, hey, AI, look at all my campaigns, see what's working, see what's happening on the measurement side optimize in real time or semi real time or on a schedule or something like that and go where the money is right so theoretically that sounds like something really amazing and there are certainly some tools out there that you can get that can automate bids and budgets and things like that how confident are you in tools like that so recently, actually, we did kind of, John, build our own API as well. So in a realm where kind of you have an advertiser that looks to automate a certain campaign creation process. So our APIs are able to plug into their backend platforms. The idea here is that kind of they can automatically launch campaigns. They can set bits. The optimization, although it's not perfect, we are still getting real close. So because right now we do serve over 150 different customers, we have a team of 30 people at max. But we still have seen that all of these automatic optimizations, especially once the human input sets certain limits on what is good, what is mid, what is bad. Once you teach that, that, that algorithm how to balance between that ROI and ROAS bits, that's when kind of we have seen them work well. Again, it's not perfect, but it's just a start. So as time goes by, definitely that optimization is a big thing in the AI space. You really have to trust your measurement to be able to automate it and to give some control over to AI, right? You really have to. And when you had a full-on IDFA, and right now on Android, when you have a GID, there's perhaps some higher level of trust in some way because you have some trackability, you have some behavioral characteristics that you can see in other places where somebody came from, all that stuff. Under scan and as it's coming, privacy sandbox. I think AI for targeting and for campaign optimization is going to get more challenging. Maybe that's better for AI because it's harder. Maybe. I don't know. True. And recently, a couple of new SDKs have been rolling out in the market that basically increase your opt-in rates to make sure that you are asking the user at the perfect time to enable them to opt-in and hence enabling you to track down as well. But so far, nothing of a perfect solution yet. Scan4, Scan5, they all have their own limitations and barriers as well. Even the marketers that have been in the industry for a long time are still having that challenge, MMPs, ad tech platforms altogether. So as you mentioned, for AI to step that up would be a challenge. But at the same time, I think that would be an opportunity as well for bright minds, people in the industry to actually stand out, companies to stand out that, hey, although your AI can do this and this, our platform can actually help you do this with the scan in place. I was just thinking, <laughs> I had to laugh to myself, you are not a slow talker. <laughs> there are some people that they listen to their podcasts at 1.2x, 1.5x speed. They're not going to be able to do that. I'm default at 1.5x. Default at 1.5x. I love it. 
Awesome. So AI for marketing is not quite set it and forget it at this point. You want a human in the loop. That makes sense. Excellent. On the creative side, I have seen a lot of people who are using generative AI solutions to augment what their people are doing and to kind of 10x what one creative can create, right? That's pretty cool. That's pretty interesting. I haven't seen the perfect solution yet that totally gets your brand and totally gets your the pieces of your art that can't change. Like, this is my guy. This is the character. This is the woman in my ads that I want every time. And I haven't seen the perfect solution for doing that, but I assume that's coming as well. I want to move on a little bit. You've come out with a new ad unit, and I don't know that it's related to AI, but you've come out with it. It's interesting. I want to talk about it. It's called Rewarded Playtime. What the heck is that? Yeah, so ad units are very important. So once a game is well in motion, you need something to monetize the game with. So you have your rewarded videos, you have interstitials, banners, and all the good stuff. And then basically in the recent years, let's say something off called as a rewarded playtime or a play to earn, as the name suggests, is a unique ad unit. So basically every time a user interacts with that specific ad, they get paid. Now this payment is not real currency as that is not perfectly permitted as well, but these are virtual currency, virtual tokens. So imagine you hop onto a certain app and offers for every minute you spend your time playing this game or discovering this app, the app owner would actually pay you in virtual currency or points inside that game. The idea here, John, was in offer walls, the common barrier was you would reward the user to actually install the app and probably hit a certain level and reward them for that, but that's about it. But down the line, when you want to see your LTVs, you know, your day 30, day 90, day 120, you basically lose out those users. But with the rewarded playtime, since the user is being rewarded for every minute they spend inside your game, that's how basically we have been ensuring LTVs stay sustainable over a longer span of time. That was the concept of a rewarded playtime, both from a user acquisition perspective and from a monetization angle as well. How's this different from a rewarded ad? Yeah, so inside a rewarded ad, what you have seen is once a user sees a certain ad, they get the reward and that's about it. In the rewarded playtime, you get a reward for watching that ad, interacting with that app. And if you were to download that game because you like that game and play that game, you would basically be rewarded for every minute you played that game. So it's not a one and done deal. You basically get played for every time you open that game and play it. Okay, so I'm in app A, I'm playing, I get an ad, I see it, I think, huh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I interact with it, I get some rewards. I tap on it and actually install the advertised app and I eventually and actually open that app and play that app. And every minute that I spend playing in that app B, the second one, the advertised app, I get rewards in app A? Exactly, exactly. Now, this could be done for a streaming app as well. Imagine you see a streaming app, you know, they have, let's say, a Netflix, a simple example, right? So let's say you download Netflix, you got a certain reward. Now, every show you watch on Netflix, you would still get a reward on the app A, so that basically accumulates over time. Okay, interesting concept, because of course, there's a cannibalization nature to mobile ads in games, right? Like. I have a game, stay in my game, but here's all these ads for other games. Go play that game. No, but come back. So <laughs> what we have seen is that we did a survey across over 500 users and almost 80% of the users did come back saying that they would actually tend to play a certain game that rewards them over time because for the users, it's a pick and choose, right? So because they're investing their time. If you are a user, you're investing your time on the offer wall discovering a new game, discovering a new offer. But at the same time, you need to pick and choose that which offer or which game helps you play and maximize your rewards as well. So most of the users were positive to the idea of being rewarded for certain things because the every minute they spend, they are being rewarded for that. The currency that you can earn as you do this, does it only accrue in the advertiser app or can it become part of a broader network where you have currency just for engaging with ads and also taking actions and potentially spend it in multiple apps? Exactly, both. So right now, for example, inside the our SDK that App Samurai offers, you have the option to basically accrue all of these currency or points and basically cash out via PayPal, cash out via Google Play cards, Amazon gift cards. Over time, you would have more deals, discount offers from Domino's and other gift cards. So we're trying to expand that ecosystem because we have seen that more and more user base is being accrued. So the broader cash out offers you give them, the more broader of an audience you can reach them, hence helping both the advertiser and the publisher for monetization. Let's say I'm a studio, a publishing studio, and I have 50 apps. Can I have one wallet across all of them? 
in theory, yes, that is uh, easily possible as well. And especially with the blockchain wallets in place, it's much more easier to streamline those tokens. You don't need to physically hold any money or attach your credit cards or debit cards, hence keeping it much more safer as well. So theoretically, yes, but probably not the functionality is not built in the SDK yet. Exactly, because the industry isn't there yet, to be honest, John. It's still a new concept, so it's still a bit slow. People are catching on to it quick. So as time goes by, we hope to make it more and more compatible with all of these new features as well. Yeah, I got to say, if I'm if I'm Rovio or if I'm Supercell or if I'm King or something like that, I'm thinking about things like that, right? I'm thinking about a King wallet or a Rovio wallet or something like that. And I'm thinking about how that works for not just within one app, but across my whole portfolio of apps and how somebody's experience and time spent in app A that I own and publish can actually be used to leverage something good and something great in app B that I own as well. Because you know what? It's not always the case that we play app A for 20 years straight. It does happen. It does happen. I've talked to uh, Talking Tom. <laughs> <laughs> there are people and they've had people playing the game for 10 years straight and i've talked to rovio and they've had people playing angry birds for i think that's a decade as well i'm not 100 percent certain it might be even longer than a decade but they have had people playing from day one i can't imagine what those accounts look like that's but, a ltv john that's a good ltv as well that's what we aim for so when you keep that's on like infinity on ltv <laughs> yes it's off the top. <laughs> that's a north star metric john that's a north star metric right so when you want a, a higher ltv we have seen this concept work much more better than a reward and ad or an interstitial in any case because then it's basically play to earn the more you spend your time the more you get paid you see it across inside your game outside your game cash out on paypal amazon gift cards it's a whole ecosystem out there john okay okay very cool well, it's been a pleasure to meet and to chat, and I look forward to learning more as we connect again. Same here, John. Thank you for having me. I hope you have a day ahead. Thank you.